Hello and welcome to United Church, especially if this is your first time joining us. Um, before we get into worship, I just want to mention that if you are joining us for the first time, then um, we would love to hear from you and we would love for you to get in touch with us. And so whatever platform you're watching on right now, if you wouldn't mind engaging in the comments and letting us know that it's your first time so we can properly welcome you or um, message the number that's about to come up on the screen and we will get in touch with you. Let's get into worship and then I'll mention what will be different about today's service a little bit later on. dark when I feel like worlds apart I remember that I'm in your heart with you you're all I've got if I really had to count the cost not a second or a minute lost with you you never ever change you're the great I am you always stay the same forget oh when i'm empty you overflow in the wreckage your word is gold in the valley you are my strength in the battle my victory in the chaos you are my peace in the desert my only drink fearless i'll take a stand because my god is the great i am He's a great I am. You are light. You illuminate and give me life. I can see the sparkle in your eyes for me. In the night, when I'm broken, I will fix my eyes. Your defender and you win the fight for me. Ever change, you're the great I am. You always stay the same, and I won't forget. Oh, when I'm empty, you overflow in the wreckage. Your word is gold in the valley. You are my strength in the battle, my victory in the chaos. You are my peace in the desert, my only drink. Take a stand, cause my God is the great I am. Oh, he's the great I am. Oh, he's the great I am. He's the great I am. Oh, no kingdom, no power. No rule can stand before the great I am. No army, no weapon, no evil can stand before the great I am. No kingdom, no power, no rule can stand against the great I am. He's the 
amazing time of worship. I absolutely love that song. My God is the great I am. He is great in our lives. He is great despite our circumstances. He is great despite what we are facing. You know what I love about God is that He doesn't change according to our circumstance. He is steadfast. He is consistent. And so today I'd love to remind you wherever you happen to find yourself to lean into God. Lean into God's greatness. Remind yourself of the fact that God has been faithful in eternity past and will continue to be faithful right into the future. Today, church, I would love to say thank you so much for your continuous generosity. At United Church, one of our core values is to be a church that is invested. And we always mention the fact that to invest means that you will see a return on your investment. And so for us, as we continue to invest and, and give generously into the life of church, we have continued um, to pack food packs and distribute them to families both in and outside of our church. And, um, you know, I see that as an investment because it's not just a food pack that we're giving away, but we are giving away hope. We are giving people life. We are giving people a chance. We are giving people the gospel through your generosity. And that is what investment means, that in a month, two months, five years, someone will be able to look back and say, thank you, Jesus, because that was more than a food pack. That was a second chance, or that was hope. And so today, let me encourage you, if you are in a position to give, continue to be generous because your generosity is an investment into the life of others. But if you are not in the position to give, maybe you are in a position that is a little bit tricky right now because of the effects of the COVID-19 virus. Can I encourage you to reach out to us and to let us know? Um, we would love to be the church for you as well. More than just expecting you to be faithful in this time, we also want to be an avenue of hope to you in this time. And so we would love to bless you, whether it's through a food pack or any other avenue, that we can be a blessing to you. Once again, um, message us on the WhatsApp number, email us at hello at unitedchurch.org.za. If you'd love to give, why don't you go to our website, unitedchurch.org.za forward slash invest, or make use of the snap scan code that's popping up on your screen right now. You can scan it in and give any amount that you would like to give today. Well, hey church, as you can see, we are doing something slightly differently today. And um, one of the things that I absolutely love about a time like this is the fact that we can try so many different things and do so many different things because we've got freedom and flexibility. Um, because we're not meeting in a building, we're doing this online, we can tap into so many different resources um, that can inspire us and equip us to do life better, to do life differently, um, to maybe find a new normal. And so today, what we're actually doing is we are speaking to our national leader, Pastor Donovan Kutsia. Many of you might remember him um, from our Easter services or from our launch if you were there. And so we're going to get straight into it and welcome him. Welcome, Pastor Donovan. Um, we hope you're doing well. Hello, Randy and Shawnee and everyone at um, United Church, Thunderbail. Good to be able to connect with you, even though it's not face-to-face, -face, it's on a virtual platform. But it's a blessing to us, and we're pleased. You're special to us as people and as a church. So God bless you. Nice to be able to chat to you. Thanks so much, Pastor D. And it's great to be able to chat to you like this. I know, obviously, um, things are quite busy on your side, needing to navigate all the churches. But it's great to be able to have a conversation like this. And before we get into things, I just want to ask a few lighthearted questions. Um, what are some of the good things that have come about for yourself and for Auntie Patricia in this time? Because I know, obviously, like I said, it can be quite a quite a heavy time for some people. But I'm sure that somewhere um, there is a little bit of good that lies beneath the surface. So what does this look like for you guys? Well, yes, this lockdown period is a strange, new weird wonderful situation and you know you can either embrace it i mean we've got to do this what can we say or you can be miserable and negative about it i say rather let's embrace it make the best of it and so there are things that have come out of it that are very beneficial first of all i count myself we count ourselves patricia and i 
count ourselves privileged to be able to have a home like we have and a garden like we have. And I know there are other people who do not have this. And so we really think about them and we feel for them. But we have this home and things we've learned, like I've learned a number of things. I've learned um, how to become a sous chef. I've helped Patricia make rusks. You know, I clean, clean up after her, fetch what she needs, mix what she needs. And then I've done a little bit of chefing myself. I've spent some time in the garden and grown these magnificent basil herbs. They're beautiful. And garden water them every day. And so what we've done is I've picked a couple of nice basil leaves and I've turned it into pesto. And uh, beautiful pesto. In fact, uh, maybe I'll send you a picture to show you how good this pesto really is. I'll tell you what, it does, may not look good, but it really tastes fantastic. The other thing that I've done is I've got involved in my garden. Got this lovely garden, and for years I've done nothing in the garden. Busy, traveling. Honestly, I've hardly been in the garden. And all of a sudden, I've had this opportunity. Every morning, part of my ritual, part of my routine, after I've had my tea, I take the water we rinse up uh, dishes that we finished washing and cups and saucers we we get the soap off we, we rinse it in a basin and i take that basin every morning i take that water and i go and water my herbs my thyme and my sage and my rosemary and the basil particularly and uh, i've also got involved in the garden in other ways it's been fantastic i haven't done so much physical work for ages i feel good i feel invigorated and my body's been used in a way I haven't used it for so long and for so so many years. And one of the things I've done is I've I've got out old tools like a, a hedge trimmer and I've been trimming the hedge. Maybe there's a clip to show you what I've been doing. This hedge trimmer running along the top of this hedge. And th this 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 ladder's pretty high. I'm I mean my feet are about six foot above the ground. Never mind the rest of my body, eight to ten foot up. And I'm really enjoying this. It's been absolutely fantastic. Yo, okay, so firstly, can I just say, I, I think it's absolutely amazing that you've managed to get your herbs to grow that well because Shani and I started gardening um, a little while back and we've had two failed attempts. And um, you know the whole saying, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Um, that saying is a little bit like out the window with us now because I'm just like, whatever. I can imagine that this is obviously bringing about some new routines for you. Um, some new ways of doing things. And I think that's exciting. Some people are good at routines. Other people are not good at routines. Some people hate discipline and routines and so on. But they say it takes 21 days to enforce a habit or break a habit. So this is a good opportunity. I live by routines. I love routines. I get up in the morning. I go through my whole routine. I've got an eye uh, regimen that I need to follow, fix my eyes up. Then I make tea. Then I watch the birds in the bird feeder while I drink my tea. Then have my daily devotion every single morning. I love this devotion by Trevor Hudson. Been an enormous help to me. And uh, then I go out and I water my garden, water my herbs, blah, blah, blah. You've heard me say that before. So I find that routine helps me. Why? Because that means that I'm in control of the day. I'm in control of the time. I am managing my time. Time isn't harassing me. Time isn't uh, freaking me out. I'm in control of my time. Routine helps me to manage my time. And even what we've discovered is that this is not a normal time. And therefore, we don't treat it as such. There's, there's obviously um, different things that we can be doing. And so we do things differently or we try to do things differently. And, and along with that, I think another thing that we've had to learn to navigate differently is also family time. Because um, with the lockdown having taken place, it's obviously both myself and Shani at home and our kids at home as well. And so I know many families are needing to navigate a new dynamic of family time. What does family time look like for you? Because obviously you are so used to seeing your grandkids um, and interacting with them, but obviously you can't now. And so what's that look like for yourself and Auntie Patricia? Uh, we've had family Zoom times together and I made a little video clip for my family for Easter, especially for my grandkids. And that's the one thing that's been the hardest not being able to see my our grandchildren. We miss them so much. And, you know, when they're that little, especially three years old, and you want to talk to them on the phone and there are other things of interest to them, they're not interested in talking to you. But we miss them. And so I made this clip. I hope you enjoy it.
honestly, I don't know how I feel about that. That is absolutely insane. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I absolutely love the fact that we can still have fun in a time like this, can't we? Now, another thing I wanted to ask you, Pastor D, is um, obviously we've had to do things differently in this time. Churches have had to take on a whole new form, um, and I think this will definitely have um, lasting effects. Um, there's no ways we can go back to normal um, after something like this. Just to get some perspective from your side, what are some of the other things that churches have had to do differently um, that you've noticed around the AOG group? Because I think this will also give us a bit of a broader perspective as to how we can better be the church. Well, yes, as the church, we've had to do things differently, completely differently. Goodness me, this has been a whole new learning curve and we've had to make massive adjustments. Um, and one of the things I think I'm hoping to get people to do out of all of this is to take the focus off ourselves, to take the church beyond our walls and to think of people less privileged. And um, some of us initiated something here in the Western Cape and uh, we've got our churches focusing on those who are less privileged. And uh, a few churches have made donations to a fund and uh, churches like Urban Edge and the View Churches and myself and Peter Watton and Jeffrey Bond and others, we've got together and we've sent out an appeal to help our churches in the townships and in the informal settlements. And we've distributed or we've put money together and purchased and packed food bags. And we've connected with our churches in the townships of Brother Naughty Bombella. And so far, I think we've helped 915 families with food. We've got lots of pictures and video clips of how this man has traveled up and down the length and breadth of the peninsula, handing out food bags to poorer people, widows, children, orphans, those less privileged. And so it's been a wonderful thing to get the church focused, particularly at this time, beyond their walls. I absolutely love what you said um, about taking the church beyond the walls, because that's ultimately what needs to happen in the season. Um, and that is an expression of the gospel right now, is that church moves beyond just from Sunday to Sunday, but we become active disciples um, in a time like this. And it's so great to see what other churches are doing in, in the Western Cape and in the Northern Cape and um, in Lipopa. I think the beauty of being part of the Assemblies of God group is that um, we can be stronger together because we get to pull from each other's resources. Um, and even us as a church, um, we've been doing so much in terms of handing out food packs for families. In fact, this week, I had the privilege of connecting with some pastors in Funabel whose churches are taking strain um, and they are not able to sustain themselves as pastors. And so we were able to hand out a few food packs to pastors whose churches aren't doing so well. And I think that's the amazing thing about this is that we can be a blessing um, in a time like this. We, often, we so often miss this thing, you know, about the connection between what God's love for us and our love for the world. And we always want to turn into something spiritual. And true spirituality is this, that we should love God with all our hearts and then our neighbor as ourselves. So it's important for us to grasp and understand that. And for today, I'd like to share this message of Beyond These Walls from John 3.16 and John and 1 John 3.16. So there's a link between these two portions of Scripture, uh, the 3.16s, John 3.16, 1 John 3.16. And John 3.16 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We all know that verse so well. It's the most quoted verse in the Bible. Um, almost anybody can quote it. It's all over the place. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. But linked to that is this verse found in the epistle, John's epistle, 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. This is what it says. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. He laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and our sisters. Now, the two verses um, are joined or are related because they have the same author. And the author is none other than John the Beloved. That's what he's known as. He's the author of the Gospel of John. And he's also the author of this epistle, John the Beloved, the Apostle of Love. When he speaks of himself or he refers to himself in the Gospel, 
he often refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And love was his life's message. That's, you know, a life's message is something we are. It's not just something we preach. A life's message is something that grips us, something we're passionate about, something that's our DNA, something that just keeps coming out of us. It's what we say, it's what we live, it's who we are, it's what we are described as. And um, it's important for us to grasp that. In fact, if you want a definition, sometimes for a word, you just need to point to a person. A loving person, somebody says, how would you define, let me say, well, so-and-so defines love, or how would you define generosity? Well, so-and-so defines generosity. And John would be the, 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 the epitome, the absolute definition of what love is. It was his life's message. Now, in John's gospel, we find that the word love appears 39 times. It's quite significant because the other three gospels, Matthew, Luke, and John, Mark, when you add them up, when you put them together, the word love appears in total in all three of those gospels 36 times. So it appears more, three times more in John's gospel than any other three put together. And in this epistle, the epistle of John, which is a short epistle, just five chapters, and they're not very long chapters, and we find that the word love appears there 25 times. So love is the preeminent thought, motive, message of this man. Well, let's go back to, for God so loved the world. It says, God so loved the world that he gave. So love leads to giving. Love is not a passive word. Love is an active word. Love is a doing word. Love is a verb. Love expresses itself. It's not good enough to just say, I love you. I must show you how much I love you. So God so loved the world that he gave. It's an active word. And 1 John 3, 18, which is just two verses after 3, 16, which is our text. It says, dear children, let us love, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. So again, John is saying, loving with words, that's cheap. Loving with action, that's what's important. Love gave, love does, love is full of action. That's the truth, John says, of what the word love means. And we've often heard this expression, you know, um, words are cheap. Actions depend on sacrifice. So it's easy to say, but it's very difficult to do. So we realize that God so loved that he gave, and we also need to love in such a way that we give. Now, it's easy to say that God gave. It's not just that John God gave. God gave his son, but actually the Bible says that Jesus had to do something about it. Uh, John fifteen thirteen, Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples uh, just before he goes to the cross, and he's speaking to them about it being uh, the branches and the vine and that they need to abide in him. And then he says this in verse 13 of John's gospel, he, 15. He says, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. So again, Jesus is demonstrating the father gave, but I came and I did. So love gives, love has to demonstrate itself in some or other way. And the way that God demonstrated is God went beyond his walls. There they were in heaven, in perfection. Let's call it their comfort zone. I mean, they, heaven, there's nothing like, I mean, you can't describe heaven. We don't know what heaven's like. It's just absolute perfection. God didn't just live there and share love between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but Jesus left that. He came beyond that, came to our planet, came and demonstrated very sacrificially, gave up his life so that we would not perish, we would not die, uh, but that's so that we could have life, not just life, not just breathing, not just eating, not just surviving, but so that we could have eternal life. So God gives, he loves, he gives in order for us to have life. And it's exactly the same with us as the church. God put us in this world, sent us into this world. We are God's gift to the world. God loves the world and gives the world his disciples. And he says to us, go out there and show what love is. Leave your comfort zone. Go beyond these walls. You see, the reason I call it beyond these walls, so many of us as Christians 
a, a full Christian experience, our spirituality is wrapped up in meetings. It's going to church. It's singing the songs we like. It's being able to raise our hands and be lost in sort of uh, this wonderful worship of God and to greet one another and to listen to a message and to connect with coffee and all the rest of it. And to us, this is this is our Christianity. This is our spiritual experience. But the Bible says, God says, Jesus says, John says, no, 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 that's that's not true spiritually. That's wonderful. That's where you need to be. I made you to be part of the church, but I want you to go beyond those walls. I want you to take what I've done for you beyond those walls. Leave your comfort zone, not only the comfort zone of your church, but the comfort zone of your home and your life and your possessions and your wealth and your materialism and go and demonstrate what God's love really is to the people out there. So I want to go back to 1 John chapter 3, the beginning of the chapter, verse 1. Just to tie it all up. John writes and he says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us. I like the use of these words. These words that express such deep emotion and deep feeling hyperbolic words he says that we should be called children of god and that is what we are that we should be called the children of god and that is what we are so god lavishes his love upon us so that we could be called the children of god in other words we bear a name it's a privilege this is our name this is given to us but you know the privilege of the name needs to be lived up to so when you and i represent a name we may need to make sure that our lives represent that name it's one thing to be called a child of God. It's another thing to demonstrate what it means being a child of God. It's like wearing a badge, a blazer, a school blazer. When you put that blazer on, you can't behave like you want to. You have to behave in a way that's reflective of what that badge stands for, what that blazer stands for. And so when you and I dress ourselves in this name and put on this name, the children of God, we must make sure that we live that way, that our lives add up to what it means to be children of God. We must be able to be bearers of the privileged name, children of God. But we're more than that. He says, not only, not only are you called the children of God, you are the children of God. And then he goes on in this chapter to describe what it means to be one of the children of God. But he says that you and I need to realize that we need to live in a certain way because we've got a future destiny. We, we've got some, somewhere where we're headed for. First one says, he's lavished his love upon us with the children of God and that is what we are, that is what we are now. Then verse two, he says this, he says, dear friends, now we are children of God, but what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And again, what he's saying is, now you're the children of God. You need to live this life demonstrating what it means to be this children, uh, uh, the children of God with this hope that is within you because hope points to the future. And the future hope that we have is that Christ will come again, that he shall appear. And when he appears, John says, you shall be like him. And what he's actually saying to us is, while you're living down here, no matter what you're going through, we need to live like children of God. We need to demonstrate what it means to be a child of God. And even when it gets difficult, we need to fix our eyes on the future because we have a future hope. And the future hope is linked to the fact that Jesus is coming and that when he comes, we will be like him. We will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. The Bible says we will be infused by the Holy Spirit. Now we are baptized in the Holy Spirit. That is a deposit guaranteeing something bigger. The infusion where the Holy Spirit will infuse us and we will be changed. We will, we will be like him. And we know we're talking about receiving the resurrection body. But it's more than that. We will receive eternal life, resurrection life. Life that cannot be confined to time or space or sickness or tears or sorrow or anything like that. But more than that, we will be like him. We will have his character. So here's the clue. Now you are the children of God. One day you will be like him. And the journey that you and I are now traveling is our training in becoming what we will be when he one day comes. So we need to have a look at what that means. Right. What does it mean? Well, we are the children of God. We bear that name. We need to behave in a certain way. And um, what he's saying to us is we need to purify ourselves. This journey that we are on 
is that we need to make sure that we become like him in every single way. Now, life reveals the children of God. Our lives reveal it. The life that he gives us reveals it. So that there's no other way of knowing what a tree is other than by its fruit. So we look at a tree and we say, wow, look at that tree. Oh, that's an apple tree. How do you know it's an apple tree? Well, it's got apples on it, for goodness sake. Oh, that's a grapevine. How do you know it's a grapevine? Well, it's got bunches of grapes on it. So we're able to identify trees by the fruit that they bear. And there's no way of knowing what a person is other than by their conduct, not by what they say, not by the faith that they declare, not by the creeds that can they can recite or the songs that they can sing. No, no. We know what a person is or who a person is by their conduct. And so that is what John's saying to us. You're called the children of God, and that is what you are. So you've got to live out by your conduct you've got to show that you bear the name properly and he says that you and I are called to be righteous righteous is an interesting word righteous means right living but right living comes from right standing your living is your walk your walk comes from your position your stance to be righteous is to be in right standing with God, to be in a right relationship with God. Now you're called the children of God. Your sins are forgiven. You're in right relationship with God. You're righteous. But now that we have that right standing, we have a platform from which to walk, from which to live. And so we are called to be righteous. We are called to walk a certain way. We are called to behave a certain way. That's what it means. And then you might say, well, what is this righteousness that we are called to? John says it's very simple. It's summed up in this, to love one's fellow men. So there you are. We know we are. We call the children of God, and that is what we are. And we've got a future hope. We look forward to being with Jesus like him one day. But in the meantime, right now, we need to live righteously. And he says the way we live righteously is to love one's fellow man then he says well okay fine if righteousness is loving one's fellow man here's the next question what is love he says it's very simple jesus is the example jesus is the image of love so if we want a picture of love an image of love then we need to just look at jesus that's what john's getting at over here a righteous living must reflect jesus that's the true life of a real disciple of Christ. So if Jesus is the image that I need to reflect, what is it that Jesus did that I need to do? Well, here comes the crunch. So Jesus lays down his life. That's the crunch. So if Jesus is the image, Jesus is the picture, Jesus lays down his life. Is John saying that we have to lay down our lives? Well, I don't think he's saying that we need to die. But what he is saying is we need to die to certain pleasures. We need to die to certain privileges. We need to die to our comfort. We need to make sure that if we have, we do not shut our hearts to those in need. If we shut our hearts, he says, to those in need, then the love of God is not in us. Then the love of the Father is not in us. And he says, then we haven't passed from death to life. He's saying straight, if you and I can't love, if you and I can't use what we've got, if you and I can't share what it is that he's blessed us with, then he's saying, then the love of the Father can't be in you, and he is saying that you haven't passed from death to life. Now, I'm not saying that. That's what he's saying. In other words, he's saying, you can't just claim to be a child of God. You've got to show that you're a child of God, and you show it by being an image of who Jesus is, and Jesus laid down his life, and he's calling us to lay down our preferences, our privileges, our possessions, if we have to, and to be able to share with other people. And, you know, today it's not that much that we need to share. There are people less privileged than us, starving, lonely. Think of it. Horrible, awful, without food, hungry. A child ain't a bit hungry. No, cannot be. It cannot happen. People lacking the basics of life. Well, some of us have got more than we need. Cannot be. Jesus is asking us 
to be willing to open ours. If we shut our hearts to those in need, then we definitely are not demonstrating what Jesus came to show us. You know, life is the opportunity. It is the chance to learn love. Life's more than just the blessings. They're enjoying. Life's about seeing people in need. Life's about demonstrating and reflecting the heart of God, the love of Jesus, the person who Jesus is. So come on, for God so loved that he gave. As a result, we have life. Jesus came and laid down his life. Then, 1 John 3, 16, if Jesus laid down his life for us, we should be willing to lay down our lives for others. We should go beyond the walls of our pleasures and our comfort to give other people life. It's about giving life. God so loved that he gave his son so we can have life. This is our opportunity to give in some small measure, to improve someone else's life. In fact, maybe to even save a life, to give life to others. God bless you and um, look forward to seeing you in church again sometime in the future. Take care. What an amazing conversation we had. I absolutely love the fact that Pastor Donovan brought so much clarity and perspective. And so um, let me remind you, why don't you, wherever you are, find ways to take church beyond the walls. Find ways to apply John 3.16 and 1 John 3.16 where we can actively love our neighbors. And there's always a way. We always need to find a way to win. There's always an avenue where you and I, if we can't give an entire food pack, we can buy one element within the food pack. Those are just simple ways where we can be the church. Let me pray for us as we close off today. God, we thank you so much for the privilege we have of being your church. And I always say it is a privilege to be a part of your church. It is a privilege to be a part of what you are doing in our community and in our nation. Not for a second do we take it for granted. And so I pray for those who find themselves on the fringes of, of what it means to be church. I pray that you would draw them closer to yourself. I pray that they would identify their need for you and may they make the decision to wholeheartedly follow you. May you then lead them deeper into what true love looks like. The kind of love that you displayed in John 3.16 that is selfless, that gives up its life for others. I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. If you would like to get in touch with us, then drop us a message on our WhatsApp phone. Otherwise, drop us an email at hello at unitedchurch.org.za. Have a great week and be blessed.